Right, okay, let's go to the Hagia Sophia topic. A lot of people are awaiting this. So, people, those of you that are unfamiliar with what's going on, Erdogan and the Turkish uh, courts have ruled that the Hagia Sophia, or known as the Hagia Sophia, I... I I like the sound of that. It has a better kind of more flow to it, the Hagia Sophia. It is to be converted back into a masjid. What do we think about this? How do we feel? And people have become really, and it has already happened. They've done the Adhan. And there's all these uh, videos on Twitter, on um, social media sites. There's reactions. People are... Um, amongst them is our Danny boy <laughs> saying some of these fools, fool, hey fool, reverting Hagia Sophia back to a masjid. Meanwhile, Hindu temples and churches being built in Muslim countries. Oh my God! <laughs> That's our Danny boy who's giving that um uh, that he's he's giving his two pence as well. So he doesn't want us to. <laughs> right. So this uh, and there were some other if I one moment, if I check, I'm pretty sure there were some other. Right. Yep. OK, cool. Now. What are our thoughts on this, people? Well, first of all, just a bit of a backdrop to the Hagia Sophia. Now, this is something that. Uh, existed way before. I mean, it may have been kind of further done up and things, but it existed before Islam. And I believe it was built by uh, Justinian. Uh, I believe it was Justinian I. And it was, in its uh, original form, a cathedral. And it was, at one point, the largest Christian cathedral uh, in Christendom. If uh, that's what it was claimed to be, the largest in Christendom, if not at least um, in the eastern part of the whole Christian world, the Byzantine dynasty, and which was uh, the kind of Roman dynasty in, in the east. So that's what it was up until uh, Sultan Fatih, Muhammad al Fatih, he conquers and then they convert it into a masjid. So the question is, first of all, should we be converting places of worship into masajid? This is one question we want to look at. Secondly, okay, even, I mean, that's, secondly, should we in now be reconverting something to a masjid? So first is the original conversion and then the reconversion to a masjid. What are our thoughts on all of this. That's the backdrop to it. I would say, uh, and adding to that, in the time of the Salaf, when we look at the Sahaba's time, many of them did not, uh, like when you look at the rulers like uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab an, when he conquered Jerusalem, uh, he didn't convert the holy sites into masjids. And even though he was given an opportunity and there was, there was, no resistance to Sayyidina Umar's entrance to Jerusalem. He did not convert the, you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or other uh, or other kind of holy sites to Christ to Muslim holy sites. He didn't do that, and that was never the objective of Islam. Okay, now this thing of the Hagia Sophia. This was converted in Sultan Fatih's time to a masjid. Some people claim he even paid some Christians for it. And I think historically, whether they did it or not, is something which, um, whether they did it or not, it happened. Khalas, it happened. Uh, I don't think Islam encourages you to convert holy sites into masjids. So, for example, if we look at the, the Qur'an, 
we will have in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah speaks about people who are given power. So Allah in verse 41, he mentions who these people are. They are people who have been given power. الَّذِينَ إِمَّكَّنَّاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ People whom if we gave them dominion over a certain land or in the earth, they established the salah. أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنَّهُوا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ They established worship for people. They established a welfare system for people, zakat. And وَأَمَرُوا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ And they commanded kindness and goodness and prevented that which was harmful. And indeed to Allah belongs the end of this affair or of all affairs. But the verse before that, uh, Allah speaks. Uh, so the one just preceding that, leading into that, mentions If Allah had not set up a certain people to resist against another group of people. لَهُدِّمَتْ سَوَامِعُ وَبِيعٌ وَصَلَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدْ يُذْكَرُ فِي أَسْمُ اللَّهِ That كَثِيرًا, sorry, it ends on فِيهَا كَثِيرًا uh, وَلَيَنْصُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ So to repeat that لَوْ لَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ If Allah had not set up a, a group of people to resist an opposing group لَهُدِّمَتْ سَوَامِعُ Monasteries, uh, places of worship, bi'un, people say synagogues, wa salawatun, and areas for restricted or restricted areas for prayer, wa masajid, that these things would have all been destroyed. Yuzkaru fi asmallahi kathiran. In in all of these places, Allah's name is glorified often. Now notice Allah says about sawami' about Christian monasteries, Allah's name is glorified in them. So, and synagogues. Allah does not say, and this is, you know, Surah Al-Hajj, this is speaking, this is in Medina. Allah is speaking about how uh, Muslims should be because he goes on to say, الَّذِينَ إِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ who are these people? These are those people who, if we give them dominion, this is what they do. That they would prevent such things, tragedies from happening. So Islam does not set out to convert holy sites to mosques. It's never That's never been the goal of Islam. But people, Muslims have done that. Okay, Many, not just Muslims, many people have done that. One may argue that one of the reasons they did that is because that these were the main buildings in their time. So people built, you know, their places of worship as major buildings. So whenever a new community came, they saw that major building and they thought, yeah, that's, you know, that's a perfect choice to make it into a prayer facility since it's designed like that. And you see that Muslims did that. Christians did that in Muslim Spain. They did that as well. Um, you know, they turned many of the masjids. But to be fair, Muslims, when they took over, they turned the, the Christian things into masjids. They also, when they took over, turned the Muslim things into Christian cathedrals. It seemed to be, you know, back and forth, a kind of a law of the jungle that took place in the medieval times. It was neither, it was not encouraged by Islam. But it wasn't prohibited if it was just something that seems to have been the politics of men that they did. So, OK, just to be clear on that. So if they did it in the past, I'm not saying it was haram. It wasn't. Uh, I suppose they've kind of conquered and this is what they did. I don't think it was a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing, but it, I wouldn't say it was haram per se because it was their politics. It was their kind of battles, it was what they were doing. And, you know, everybody seemed to be like a a practice that people were doing, like the way they took slaves. I think that a, a, was a detestable thing. But the whole world was doing it. Muslims were doing it. Christians were doing it. Everybody was doing it. So it's like that. 
Now, the question is that it did become a masjid and for many centuries it remained a masjid. Now, when Turkey was set out as a separate state, nation state, um, in the kind of decades that followed, you see that this Hagia Sophia, the Hagia Sophia, was turned into just a museum. Now, the argument has come that we need to convert this back into a masjid. Why? Because it was once upon a time a masjid. This is the crux of the argument, that why should we turn this into a masjid? Because it was once upon a time a masjid. Now, I would say, look, it's not about halal haram. Okay, because the Hagia Sophia is in a Muslim country. It is the property of the state of Turkey. It is the property of Turkey. They can, you know, from an Islamic perspective and from this statutory legal perspective, they can do with it whatever they want. You know, they it's a listed building, but if Turkey decides to turn it into whatever it wants, they could. You know, they could say, we're going to put a car park on this side. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to, you know, it's up to them. They, they could say, we're going to have opening hours on this time. We're going to do this. The question, so it's not about what is legal and illegal or what is haram and, you know, not haram. It's not about that. So, but the question is, is this a rightful action, right and wrong? And there are things like the Hadith teaches you that you will know them when they are wrong. I would say that this Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia, converting it into a masjid is absolutely wrong. It is, uh, it is a great mistake that is being celebrated by people. Wallahi, these people, I feel, lack um, insight about, this, about world affairs. Turkey, I feel, is only doing this to gain brownie points. The, the, the regime is doing this. They're pushing it to gain brownie points with other states to become the new leaders of the Islamic world. Turkey is, you know, Erdogan for a while has been trying to shape out his identity as the new Amir al-Mu'minin in Islam. <laughs> <laughs> and he's trying to rival Saudi Arabia, who have had that position traditionally. I don't know why, except that the Haramein are there. So Turkey has now tried to, you know, first of all, with this Ertegel drama, uh, promoting this everywhere. And they've been doing this with many other mosques as well, by the way, uh, in Turkey, churches, turning them into mosques and things like this. But this Ertegel thing, that spreading this, I, I you know, I... I've not watched a single episode. I can't, honestly, I find these things preposterous. But anyway, to a lot of people love the drama. Fair enough. I haven't got anything against the drama per se. But they look, you have to understand something. The Ottoman Empire was never, it was nothing more than a dynasty that just happened to be Muslim. It is not symbolic of Islam. Um, they were... You know, nothing. In fact, the Ottomans, their first, you know, what the actual rule was, they what they had concretized as the unspoken law was as soon as the next sultan comes in, fratricide, or mandatory fratricide. Whoever is going to come in has to kill all his brothers. This was the unspoken, I mean, it was the unwritten law. And even some of the Hanbali ulama gave them the fatwa that it's permissible. I don't know what they were, <laughs> what they were smoking, but yeah. So, the the Ottomans were never these representatives of Islam. They never even claimed to be this. You know, this is the dumb thing that you know Muslims today are so. Some Muslims, these kind of romanticized ones, are so in you know in a dreamy state of mind. The Ottomans never claimed to. If you read the uh, the titles that the Ottomans used to give themselves, it was the, they used to give themselves the title. Caesar of Rome. That was their title, the Caesar of Rome, <laughs> including Fatih and these people. <laughs> you know, they go on about him and, and other people. Look, 
sure they i'm not saying they were horrible people they may have had some i mean they they were just people they had good sides to them they had really bad sides to them they were not symbols of islam later on we romanticized them to be these symbols of islam they weren't even in the Middle East so much later on when they established. They were more so in Eastern Europe. But they had nothing, you know, the way we pitch today, it's presented like this dream image. Oh, they were like, sure, I mean, they were Muslim. And I'm not saying that they didn't respect Islam. I'm sure in their own way, they respected Islam, just as Muslims today respect Islam. Um, but they weren't symbols of Islam, you know, if, if that makes sense to you you're not going to see today countries like you know is uh i don't know do you see? <laughs> but even they don't so yeah so the problem with this with this converting uh uh the Hagia Sophia, first of all this has if you see right just one moment if i bring here you can see people will say that look I'd like to, uh, you can see here that uh, this is a, uh, the quality didn't come up well here, but you've got here the blue masjid, yeah, the Sultan Ahmed Masjid, by walking on foot is a four minute walk from the Hagia Sophia. A four minute walk. <laughs> four minutes. That's how it is, literally just in front of it. Right now, there is no need for a new masjid. We don't have a need. There, first of all, I'm just trying to eliminate that aspect. There is no need. Okay, the Sultan Ahmed Mas Masjid, the Blue Mosque, famous Blue Mosque, has the capacity of at least ten thousand people inside it. It's a huge masjid. Um, so the, first of all, just to clarify, it's not a need basis. I just want to get that out the way. The second thing is that people might say, okay, there isn't a need, but this used to be a mosque. So we have the Haq as Turks in a country, Turkey. It is a Muslim. It is a country of Muslims by population, democratically speaking. We can convert it back, can we not? But then I will say to you, and this I'm saying to all Muslims who are supporting this, yeah. You know, and they're acting all emotional. Oh my God, the Hagia Sophia had the Adhan. Are... <laughs> stupid. I'm not going to let you get that. <laughs> that is so stupid. Because every masjid in, in Istanbul has got the Adhan. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh my God, we've heard the Adhan from the Hagia Sophia. Oh my God, I'm so emotional. Abeo mere chache. <laughs> you know that large blue masjid over there. What is that <laughs> announcing? What are all these other hundreds of masjids in Istanbul announcing every day, five times a day? The Adhan. Stop acting like you've never heard the Adhan. Stop being such a drama queen. You know, this whole thing, people saying, oh my God, it's so, oh my God, oh my God, the Adhan. Look, I want to say to all these people who are having this cathartic moment, of joy and they're saying well we have the legal right because democratically there are more muslims i mean there's atheists and christians there as well but there are more muslims in turkey clearly and therefore it's under our jurisdiction we can turn it into a mosque this thing which which i will call the thrasymachan rule that so you know thrasymachus who was a contemporary of socrates he believed that might was right that if you've got the power you can do it might is right. So this law or the principle or, you know, Thrasymachan principle or the law of Thrasymachus, if you want to abide by this, fair enough. But don't come crying tomorrow when Masjid al-Aqsa, because it's under Israeli control, is then converted back to the Temple of Solomon because it was the Temple of Solomon that before it became any masjid and it is under their control don't come crying back when uh, about the babri masjid or any of these other masjids in india that they say was a mandir 
was Ram Mandir, that this masjid used to belong to such and such temple of such and such Lord before it became a masjid. It is our right as a democratic majority of India, as Hindus, to convert those masjids back to Hindu temples. Why not? All we need is, uh, you know, it's the law, it's the law of Thrasymachus. Might is right. It's whoever has the majority. All we need is a legal right and we can do it. So why are you crying your heads off at things like Jerusalem? You know, what's your problem? Or is it, oh, acha cha when it's against us, then it's bad. You know, this is the stupidity, the lack of insight. In this day and age, I accept that it was a masjid, you know, for many years. But before that, it was a cathedral. Now, for decades, it's been a museum. You don't need a new mosque. You don't need, you know, people are not dying to pray. You know, this kind of like, oh, my God, we've got nowhere to pray. Right. Leave it. Let things be. You know, you've got a masjid four minutes in front of it. Literally, that capacitates thousands. Right. And you've got hundreds of masjids in Istanbul. So, you know, there's no shortage of masjids. Now, you're going to say, well, you know, no, no, no. The power of Islam. I want to hear the adhan. It's so beautiful. Like I've never heard the adhan, even though that large masjid over there is announcing it every day and all these other hundreds of masjids are announcing it on speakers which is a bid'ah let alone that we, we don't go into that discussion the adhan was never meant to be uh, you know kind of like yelled on the top of speakers but anyway jello will let that slide the point is that you've got the adhan but no we want to hear it from this museum because islam is we've got power tk but the power that 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 swings both ways see and tomorrow and israel is expanding this is why i you know like you can't then have this kind you can't play it like that i feel by that argument israel absolutely has the right by that argument to take down uh what is it masjid al-aqsa and convert it why doesn't it by that argument by the principle of thrasymachus it's their land their legal rights their courts have ruled and they've got the power and it was, first of all, Temple of Solomon before it was any masjid. So, yeah, so I, I feel that this is, you know, part of this is the right wing fascism that is rising in the world today. And it's not just Hindu nationals. It's not just Trump supporters. It's not just uh, far right Jewish Zionists. It's also Muslims as well who are doing exactly the same thing except they're coming back crying wolf when, you know, when it's being done against Muslims. So I would say, look, just think these things through, for God's sake. That you, do you really need a masjid? And people say, well, it's still going to be a museum, but it's going to be a masjid as well. Subhanallah, subhanallah, you know. And, oh, and when it was a masjid, it was a waqf. I heard this one guy say, when it was a masjid, it was a waqf. An endowment and a waqf can never be overturned. A cha cha cha. <laughs> and Abu Hanifa, <laughs> Tamare Abu, <laughs> what, what did Abu Hanifa used to say? And keeping in mind that they are Hanafi, uh, with the method, although they diss Abu Hanifa on this later on, <laughs> they forget him as well. You see, look at the power of politics, huh? When Abu Hanifa himself, the founding father of his madhab, he says there's no such thing as waqf. Okay, you can, waqf is an endowment that you can never be overturned. He says that, yes, you can donate the benefits of something, but it will always remain, uh, you know, you can always overturn it. And then obviously they walk away from Abu Hanifa on this because it doesn't uh, serve the interest of the polity, it doesn't serve the interest of the powers that of those that are in power. It doesn't serve the interest of the clergy who used to get a lot of their money from the endowments. And I'm not saying the endowments are a bad thing. They are a financial system that was very helpful. But the reason the scholars were so behind it was because it was through endowments that they got their money. So 
you know, and, and, and this is a fine example, despite almost worshipping, you know, I use that term loosely, Imam Abu Hanifa, the Hanafis, yet on this they throw him under the bus. You know, who's Abu Hanifa? So what if he said it? <laughs> this is the Hanafis will say, so what if he said it? <laughs> you think a cha-cha-cha. And all this other time, when we're saying all these things, you're like, no, but Imam, Imam Azam, Imam Azam, Abu Hanifa, you know, one of our teachers, he used to be like, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa. <laughs> and here they throw him under the bus because it doesn't serve the cha-ching. But this is my point anyway. So, um, look, this thing, I feel it has already now become a masjid, but it is a great mistake because tomorrow, you know, you, you go up a notch, then Zionism will go up a notch. They will take it, take Jerusalem exactly as they want it. India, fascist Hindus will take it up a notch. They've already built Ram Mandir now, haven't they? They've built Ram Mandir. And now they're gonna, they're gonna, they'll probably start with other things. Let's convert this back to a Hindu temple. Let's convert this back to a Hindu temple. Look at when Allah says in the Quran, in all of these places, Allah's name is being glorified. I'm not saying this. If I was to imagine that verse wasn't in the Quran and I said that today, that oh, but Allah's name is glorified in all these places, people would have said, He's a kafir, he's a dajjal for saying that. How can he say? You know, I spoke to somebody. Um, Damn, I did my live and then I kind of switched off, but he was still on there. And we ended up chatting and he spoke about Christians and he was like, Christians are the greatest mushriks, mushriks, mushrik billah, you know, mushrik, we can't have any respect for them. Allah, you see, if I had said this to you, which I, I'm saying it to you, you're going to say, well, you're just a deviant anyway. Allah is saying that, you know, these places, sawami'un wa bi'un wa in all of these places, Allah's name is so often, kathiran, so often glorified. That yet you, yeah, but anyway, I, so I, so I am kind of like, I, I see all these things and I see the ignorance and it really, and I see the insecurities and it does disturb me. And that's why I was saying that. And I've seen these videos on the Mandir as well, by the way, in, in Islamabad and people have gone there and they're saying that anyhow this Mandir is built and if Imran Khan wants to build a Mandir, he should build it in his backyard. <laughs> they're like, where he's got a mansion behind that, he should just build a Hindu temple then. Yeah, what is the problem? What is the problem? Honestly, I don't get it. You know, this whole thing of, see, Muslim, this is the problem. We've become such bigots. We want everybody to be tolerant towards us. We want everybody to give us a second chance. We want everybody not to judge us, to be accommodating for us. When Pakistan Muslims will talk of India, they will say, yeah, what's wrong with these people? Why can't they accommodate for those Muslims? Why can't, why can't they allow them to build their masjid? Why can't they allow them to carry on with the madrasa? Why can't they allow them to have their own talaq system? Why can't they allow them to... All of these things they will say, Muslim, Pakistani will say, yeah, what's wrong with India? Why doesn't... And when it comes to them, oh my God, Allow Hindus to have a temple. Toba, Toba, Toba. This is the land of Tawheed. <laughs> you know, this is the, the problem, isn't it? We've become such a bigoted, um, intolerant people who only know victimhood. We can only cry when we're victims. We're never compassionate towards other people. We're never like understanding. We are just always, oh, the world doesn't show us sympathy. The world doesn't show us sympathy. Well, yeah, I mean, this is why I actually, I do support them building for other cultures in Pakistan. Pakistan is not a khilafah, for God's sake. It's a nation state. It's a state that has 
It's a sovereign state that has citizenship. And in the citizenry, you've got all subjects are equal. Muslims are not above non-Muslims in Pakistan. It's like saying in the UK, you can't, it's not Christians because it's fundamentally a Christian country above non-Christians. So you can't expect, you know, oh, because they, there's so many, there's only a few Hindus, why should they have the right? It's like, why should Muslims in the UK have a right to have a masjid? Well, there's only a tiny percentage. Well, look, you, it's, it's an equality, an egalitarian approach. But yeah, I hope these words, uh, you know, give some meaning to those who wanted me to speak about it.